to dismiss our children to Sunday school at this time. Again, I'm so glad you're here. I'd like you to turn to Psalms 27. Verse number 10. It says, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. There's no orphans when it comes to Jesus. Amen. I don't have parents alive anymore, but I have a father who is more than alive. Teach me thy ways, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Make it very clear, God. And then if you'll turn to Malachi chapter 4, verse number 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. I believe in these end days, God has put something in the heart of fathers that love their children and in the hearts of children that love their fathers. Um, there could not be a greater love than parents for their children. Mothers or fathers running into a burning building to save their child at risk of their own life. That's real love. Real love is a savior that robes himself in flesh and dies on a cross because he loves us so much. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the tithes and the offering. God, that you touch Brother Marcourt, that you make your word alive to us. Let your word touch our mind, but also our heart. It's all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, tonight, can you imagine having church twice in one day? I mean, it's really amazing, yeah. It's like wanting to see my wife in the morning and in the evening, you know. What's with that? Glory to God. And my wife's retired husband will be preaching tonight at 6 o'clock. <laughs> Glory to God. I am grateful for having a father who knew who he was. You know, there's such confusion today. He taught me how to shoot a gun. He taught me manly things. He, he uh, taught me that sports was a good thing through baseball with me. Let men be men and women be women. Amen. Amen. There's something like that in the Bible. There are some people today who are so confused about their gender. I don't understand it, folks. Um, God didn't make a mistake when he made you. He made you just the way you are. You know, you may criticize yourself, but when you're criticizing yourself, you're criticizing God because he made you to look the way you are and to be who you are. How can a Supreme Court justice not be able to define what a woman is? What's wrong with this country? It, God made it very clear that there was to be a separation of genders by clothing and hair and position, our sensitivity, our emotions, everything is different, glory to God, and the church should be a clear sign to the whole world of our distinction. I am so glad that my wife is not like me. We are so different, and that's what causes the attraction, folks. The first not good in the Bible is in Genesis 2 and 18. You've heard me say this before. The Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Glory to God. We can't be by, our, you know, the next generation won't happen without a man and a woman. Glory to God. Amen. 
Take your Bibles and turn to uh, 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, starting in verse 1. God lays it all out. Now, there's nothing in the Bible that says a man is more valuable than a woman, you see, but it's a different role that a woman plays than a man, and we can't exchange those roles and still have God bless us. 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 says, Be ye followers of me, even as also I am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I deliver them unto you. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So there is an order. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesying with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. And we're not going to go into that. Most of you understand. For if a woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, and let her be covered. For a man indeed ought to not cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman is of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. God created a woman to be the helpmeet or the partner of the man. And, and God has so designed the family so we are happy and content because of that union. My son and my daughter have been asking me all week, now, what do you want for Father's Day? And I told them I wanted a red Ferrari. And I keep getting up looking in the driveway. There's nothing there, you know. Father's Day, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. If, uh, if fathers, you have said that, don't believe them because it is a big deal. They want you to address and honor them. On Mother's Day, you cannot get a reservation in any restaurant. But on Father's Day, you could probably go to any restaurant and just walk right in. But there will be a sacrifice of meat on a grill someplace because that's what the fathers do. Here are some good reasons for being a man. You may want to take notes. The garage is yours. Mm -hmm. You can go to the bathroom by yourself without any support. If someone forgets to invite you to their place, you still can be friends with them. Yeah. Uh, you can do your nails with a pocket knife. And if something mechanical goes wrong, you can bash it with a hammer. <laughs> if any guy shows up with the same outfit that you have, you become friends for life. <laughs> and none of your buddies will ever trap you with, so have you noticed anything about me that's different? <laughs> Now, we are different folks. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We have heard so much about fathers who, who don't take responsibility for their families. And, and I guess it's true to a certain extent. We're living in a selfish generation, you know, or there wouldn't be so many babies aborted. But according to the National Center for Fathering, there is a fathering awakening that is taking place in this country. Men are more apt to put families first than ever before. In the year 2000, Time Magazine said dads could become dinosaurs. Not true. You are needed more than ever, more than ever. Fathers have to be the backbone of the family. They are the model role for who the children become. The word father is found in the Bible 852 times. Baptism is found 16 times. 
You, you see the emphasis God puts on the Father. Each Hebrew and Greek word in the Bible has a corresponding assigned number in the lexicon, you know, uh, number 235 or 6,000, whatever. Number one is the, the number for fathers. Would you turn to Job in the Old Testament? Chapter 1, starting in verse number 1, familiar scripture for most of us. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil or just hated evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels, 5,000 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all of the men of the East. So he had family, and he had riches, he had a household, he had a reputation, Verse 4 says, And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for the three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sacrificed, sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart. Thus did Job continually. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence cometh thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro, in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? So we find here that God was complimenting Job and what he was doing, and he blessed them. You know, later on you find that the devil says, does, does Job serve you for not? No, no, God blessed him. You're not serving God for nothing. God will bless you because you're doing the right thing, you see. Job stood in the gap for his children, which was the, the most important thing that he had, not his household, not his riches, prayed and made offerings for them continually. God said he was a perfect and upright man, and putting his family first was the first attribute mentioned by God. Not all the things that he had, but he considered his family first. The problem with society today is there are not enough uh, role models, especially for fathers. And so, their children don't understand what they are to do. There are certain things my father instilled in me that are still in me and always will be in me. Someone we can look up to, someone we can emulate or pattern our life after. What else do we have? Those that just aren't living right perhaps never had a role model within their life. We shouldn't be shocked if our, our children are turning out like the world if they spend most of their time in the world. You, you see, there are more gangs today than ever before. Why? Because they need a leader. There, there's more emphasis put on sports today than ever because they want to be a part of something that's important. Perhaps they had a failure as a father. They must have a role model they can see over and over and over again. My, um, my daughter bought me something for Father's Day, and um, it's really a unique thing. It's a program, and the program sends me a question 
about things in my life. Um, where was your first trip? What do you value? And, and I fill it out, and then the next week there's another question, and at the end of the year, there's a book that is made and all of the answers to the question. Today, I wish I could ask my dad a few more questions, and I can't. But it's a wonderful thing to have a heritage of, this is what dad said. This is, you know, it's kind of like a book. Amen. He's not here, but he wrote things down for each and every one. I wonder what God thinks about this, and, and there it is in black and white. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Have to have that role model. Jesus said, when you see me, see the Father. He set up a role model in flesh. It could have been, he just wrote about it, but he came in flesh. Spent three years, three and a half years with 12 men, and he instilled in them the character that he was. As we look to God as a role model, we become more like him. The more time we spend with him, the more we become like him. Um, there are some inherent characters that we all have in our natural father. Um, sometimes we walk just like dad used to walk, you know? When I have a real tough project, I find myself biting my lip like my father did. Those are some things that are inherent within us that came through the DNA. Um, it's not something that was trained, it was built in. But there are many other characteristics that we pick up just by being near, watching, you see, what they did. Valuing the same thing that they valued. The old saying is, the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree, implying that our children will not be very different than the person our father was. Need a role model. Glory to God. Fathers, we can't expect our children to become something that we are not. They become what they see, not what we said they should be. We can say, this is the way, but if you don't, they won't, you see. And the more time we spend with God, the more we become like him. We take on the character of God, the values of God, what he loves. Like, like Paul says, I love the things I used to hate, and I hate the things that I used to love. Our children won't want to pray if we don't pray. Our children won't want to come to the house of God if we don't come to the house of God. Oh, we could say to them, it's very valuable that you're, but if you're not there, our children will not want to read the Word of God if we don't read the Word of God. Psalms, chapter 127. Verse 1. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh up in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. You see, the, the greatest thing As arrows in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full. I'm not really sure how many that is, folks. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemy in the gates. So God saying, your greatest blessing are those that are your children. In my 30s, I was building a business. I spent long hours building a business, sometimes away from my family, 
when I became 42, I started building this church. And I threw myself into it, sometimes three and four Bible studies a week. But my most important role was being a father and a husband. You can't say, well, you see, I don't have time for my family because I have a business. I want to give them everything. I don't have time for the family because I have a ministry within the church. All those things are good, but the priority is your family. Children desire their, um, their father and, and they derive their value based on how their father perceives them. There are a lot of people who are frustrated and, and have very little self-worth because their father didn't instill in them how valuable they were. We need to speak to our kids and, and, and tell them how valuable they are. And, and there are so many kids today that just never heard those words from their parents, their father. Um, and that's, that's what God has done over and over. He tells us over and over through his, his word that he loves us, that he values us, that he'll never leave us. He will always take care of us and defend us. Now, he, if he understands the value of saying these things to us over and over, how much more does a father and mother need to do that with their own children? There are many adults today who have a hard time with self-worth because their father never, well, took on that role. And then their sons couldn't take a, the proper role either because they didn't know how to function, to express their love for their wives and for their children. Satan has somehow planted the idea that to be manly it is to be cold and distant to their wives and children. That especially um, was true in, in my generation. For some reason, um, men think, hey, the only way I can be manly is not to show any emotion. And, and one of the first experiences you have with God is coming into his presence and, and tears start to stream down your face. God's got to break us of that hardness and open us up to sensitivity to him, you see. <laughs> Glory to God. It's not a sign of weakness. It's really a, a sign of strength. Now I ask you, did Jesus openly demonstrate his love for, for his disciples? Absolutely. Did he not only tell them over and over again, but he sacrificed for his children. He sacrificed it wasn't the nails that kept him on the cross. It was the love that he had for his children. Amen. Amen. And was there ever anyone who was more manly than Jesus? Right. Glory to God. You know, we feel the touch of God all the time, not just in church service. You, you can feel God's touch wherever you are, whether it's in a car or whether you're at home. Uh, he'll spend all of the time that you want to spend with him there's no time that he says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm too busy. We can laugh together, we can cry together. Because he loves it. He loves what happened here this morning when we were worshiping. I, I've said this before, years ago I was in, in Nigeria doing a Bible school graduation and there were about 350 people in, in the service. I mean, the people are so poor, they had a drum and they had a guitar but the guy with the guitar only had like three strings on the guitar I was on the platform and and people came forward and and they were dancing um, and and interacting with each other and and I felt something that I had never felt ever before in church and and because I had that question in my mind What's the difference? God instantly told me. He said, they were playing before me like children, you see. They love me 
and they love to be in my presence, and, and they're carefree, you know? We come in here and we drag so many things with us. We should be able to just love God as little children love their parents, you see. Glory to God. You see, fathers are an enigma to their children. We know that they are the authority and they administer discipline. And, and some of you understand what I'm talking about. Um, and, and that's love based on, we even heard it uh, Wednesday night in Hebrews, the 13th chapter. But we also long for the approval of our father. So there's an enigma, he's the disciplinarian and he's, uh, you know, the authority, but we're also craving that love. How can discipline and love reside in the same person? You see, if God loves you, he'll also discipline you because he loves. Over the years, I've recognized the, the people who love their parents the most had parents who were very strict because they recognized they love me, you know? I mean, when I was dating my wife back in the 1800s, <laughs> I had to have her home by 9 o'clock, you know? <laughs> Glory to God. I I'm grateful that my father-in-law let her live with me after we were married, you know? It's just... But there were strict rules, you know? And I recognized that there, there were restraints on my life, but I recognized they care enough about me to put rules. He cares enough about us that he has given us some parameters by which we have to live. If he said, Ed, hey, just do whatever you want, society says it's not important to go to church anymore, and the way you dress, and the way you act, and what you watch, and what you say, then we're thinking, God, do you really love me? I'll come up with something better tonight, folks. <laughs> Would you like to hear about tough love? This might be hard for you to even read. If you go to Deuteronomy... 21 and verse 18 it says if a man have a stubborn and rebellious son which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him out onto the elders of the city and onto the gate of this place. And they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all of the men of the city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shall thou put evil away from among you. And all Israel shall hear and fear. Now, we don't do that. I don't think we do that. But should we do any less if our kids are stubborn and rebellious? Do we just say, oh, that's, that's just the way he is, you know? And later on, when he gets older, he'll change. No, he won't. There have to be some parameters. That's, that's what a father does. It's not easy to discipline our children, but it's the right thing to do, you see. A father's love and, and commitment doesn't end when the paycheck is in the bank or even after our children are married. You're still a father, glory to God. A father is always a father. You, you don't... You don't leave that role. I remember when I was in my 50s, whatever my father wanted, I'd drop everything and, and take care of him because, you know, Ephesians 6 and 1 says, Honor thy father and mother that it would go well with thee and thou would live a long life. Glory to God. I believe that Job was the example of that 
father. He could be a, a role model for fathers today. Jesus said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Now, we read in the first chapter of Job how God had blessed Job with a whole lot of things. But that didn't cause God to brag on him. God was bragging on him because he loved his family so much that he continually prayed and sacrificed for them. Amen. I don't know where your kids are. I know a lot of pastors who have children who have walked away from church. But I'll tell you what, they continually pray for them. You know, I, I think about when David came with his 450 men back from Ziklag to Ziklag, and uh, the enemy came in and took all of their family and all of their possessions. And the men started accusing David, if we would have been home, none of this would have happened. And he said, excuse me, let me encourage myself in the Lord. And God says, that you should go after, rescue, and recover all. And they did. Verse 5 said, When the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of all of them. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart, Thus did Job continually. Now we have needs every day. But perhaps one of the first things we should pray for is our family. God, watch over my children. God, watch over my wife. God, watch over my husband. Because it's the most valuable. There isn't anything that you can take to heaven except your family not even a red Ferrari, you know? The things, you know, I was saying to my wife the other day, you know, I'm old. And, and I walk around the house and we have collected things from trips all over the world. And, and I look at things and say, why did I buy that, you know? It's not as important today as it used to be, you see, and now I'm starting to, to talk like her mother, who was 93 when she died, saying, don't leave here without taking something. <laughs> because it's meaningless. All of the effort, all of the sacrifice, all of the things that we thought were so important that we needed to make ourselves happy, when you get a little bit older, you recognize, mm -mm, I need to take some time with my family. See, and, and your kids may be in that stage that I was in, where they're in, involved in building a career and building a house, and you know, all of that's good. But you need to emphasize to them, you know, those things aren't as important as staying in touch with your family and staying in touch with your God. Glory to God. God has called us first to be good fathers of his heritage. Our children, our spiritual babies, and those of the family of God. You see, we can't minister to people if we don't first take care of our families. Oh, I have a ministry. So I can't spend a time with my family like I used to. No, that's not true. It's not true. 
You won't have a ministry very long if you neglect your family. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy. Third chapter, verse number one. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Uh, the word bishop there is um, an office within the church, a position. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine or striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Amen. Glory to God. It's important. It's important. People who work in high places many times work with a net just in case they fall. Men building high, you know, bridges or, or skyscrapers, washing windows, high wire acts, they have confidence knowing that if, if they should fall, well, there's going to be something that's going to catch them. A father is like that net. When my son was little, he, he just yelled, hey, dad, and then jump off the steps, just confident that I was going to... He doesn't do that anymore at 48. <laughs> um, as a child, we did those things. But as we grow up and our father isn't so close, we become more fearful and less daring than we were before. You see, if you know that there's a God that's going to catch you, you're more daring, you know? You're, you're more willing to step out and do some things that you ordinarily wouldn't do. I still work with a net. I have a father that always watches out for me. Don't worry about it. I got this. You see, if you're willing to do what I want you to do, if you're willing to stay close to me, I'll take care of the rest of it. You know, as we become as a little child, God says, he's going to take care of us. Uh, if you'll turn to a very familiar scripture in Psalms 91. As our musicians come. Starting in verse number one. He that dwelleth in a secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty when you're close to God, you're under his shadow. It's really close. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noise, noisome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the rewards of the wicked." Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuse, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh to thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adler, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet, because he hath set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, 
because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Our Father can keep us from falling. He's the net. Jude 1 and 24 says, Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Some of you, like me, no longer have a natural father. Maybe some of you here never had a natural father that you knew but your heavenly father. Now he's always, always watching you. Hebrews 4 says, he is touched by the feelings of our weakness because he was in all temp points tempted just as us. Therefore, let us come boldly onto his throne in time of need. It's always there. Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. And he's like Job, always making sacrifice. His mercy endureth forever. If I were him, I would have gotten rid of me a long time ago, given up on me. But his mercy and his love. And when I'm really down, there's this touch or this word of encouragement. And uh, I don't tell him enough. See, I was of that generation that was hard for me to express my love for my family like I ought until I came into the church. And then I realized this is important. It really is. Glory to God. Do you love him this morning? Stand with me. I don't know if you can say it enough. Jesus, I love you. Yeah, but I said it so many times before. I think he still likes to hear it. it says in Revelation, there's only one thing. I don't want you to lose your first love. The altar is open. Would you come?